veteran, Heisman Trophy winner, Super Bowl MVP, and six-time Pro Bowl participant, please welcome to the stage, legendary quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, Roger Staubach. Leading the team to three Super Bowl victories, please welcome Pro Football Hall of Famer and Fox Sportscaster, Troy Aikman. Super Bowl Championship, the NFL MVP Award, the NFL Rushing Crown, and the Super Bowl MVP Award all in the same season. Please welcome to the stage the league's all-time rushing leader, Pro Football Hall of Famer, Emmitt Smith. Yeah, baby! legend with 21 years with the Dallas Mavericks, an NBA and NBA Finals MVP, a 14-time All-Star team member, and is considered the greatest power forward of all time. Please welcome the NBA's number six career scoring leader, Dirk Nowitzki. Ladies and gentlemen. Let me say this. Let me say this very quickly. Look at who we have up here, just to remind you to fill in some of the gaps. Only five men in the history of the NBA have scored more points than Dirk Nowitzki. And only three months after retiring, he's now the second best player the Dallas Mavericks have ever had. Uh. That hurts. That hurts. I'm telling you, Luka Doncic is really good, by God. I'm just saying. <laughs> More than 17,000 rushing yards. A member, a member of the NFL's all-time top 100, Emmett Smith. <laughs> a member of the top 100 of all time college football's all-time All-American quarterback, Roger Staubach. <laughs> Which begs the question, Troy, how the hell did you get up here? I mean. <laughs> I'm asking myself that question. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, Roger, since you and I are the only uh, military guys here, let, let's start off with what I think gets into the wheelhouse. Why, why the Navy? I mean, you could have, you're a good Catholic boy. You could have gone to Notre Dame. You could have gone to Ohio State. What made you choose the Navy, knowing that you had the career commitment after uh, the four years? Well, yeah, in high school, I was switched to quarterback. It changed my life. Actually, I was a defensive back and receiver. My senior year, I played quarterback, and that's the first time um, I, I, I did talk to Purdue and Ohio State, and I had uh, my, the center on our team. We were co-captains of our team, and he wanted to go to the Naval Academy, and so he, asked, he said, you know, would you go up there with me? And I said, yeah, I'd like to see it sometime. So I went up to visit the Naval Academy with Jerry Mopper, my, my good friend, and um, so he decided not to go to the Naval Academy, and I liked it so much, I decided to go to the Naval Academy. So uh, it, it, I, I, wanted to, I, I wanted to play, uh, I played baseball in, in all four years in Navy, and I, play, I loved baseball. And so I, I, I knew I could get an education. I'd be forced to get a great education um, and still be able to play sports in college. 
and, 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 I, and, and I really had a lot of respect for the military, but I really wasn't into it as much as, uh, until I got there, as much as uh, I support and admire and love the military. But th that, that um, had, it, that wasn't the main objective. Mm -hmm. Originally, it was just to go to get a great education and to play sports. Which is why I'm assuming you went to Oklahoma? Uh, <laughs> for, for the sports or the education? Yeah, well, um, <laughs> what, what, what made you, as a quarterback, what made you possibly think that playing for Barry Switzer in that offense uh, was going to be the place you needed to go? Well, in hindsight, I mean, it doesn't look like a very good decision, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the time, uh, not to date myself or anyone in the room, but Marcus Dupree had been there, and yeah. they were running the I formation. And so Barry was recruiting me out of high school, saying that they were going to stay in the I formation and be a pro-style offense. And meanwhile, he was recruiting a lot of running backs and telling them that they were not going to stay in the I formation, that they were going to go back to the wishbone <laughs> and, uh, and do it the way they had been doing it. And the problem was, was that none of us were talking amongst each other. And so... People always point to why I went to Oklahoma. Keith Jackson, he was the uh, All-American tight end, one of Great the tight end. number one tight end in the country out of Little or Pine Bluff or Little Rock, Arkansas, and he was in my recruiting class. He, he, you know, he, he was sold on the I formation, pro style, throw the ball thing as well, and uh, you know it didn't work out. Obviously, I transferred and, and, and it worked out in, in the best interest for me, but. Uh, yeah, had I known, I had planned on going to Oklahoma State my entire senior year, and Jimmy Johnson. Really? Hold on a second. Really? Well, <laughs> Jimmy Johnson. Really? Jimmy Johnson was the head coach, uh, so I've known Jimmy since oh. I was 16, 17 years old. He was, but had I have gone to Oklahoma State, which I told Jimmy I was coming, uh, he actually left right after signing day yeah. and got the head job in, in in Miami. So I never would have actually played for him, even if had I. Gone. Jimmy Jimmy kind of had a tendency to walk out on you a lot, didn't he? Uh, well, <laughs> when uh, are you still with me, Emmett? Are you still with me? All right, give me give me your give me your background and try to make it shorter than Staubach and Aikman did. Uh, how, how many offers? What were you sifting through before you decided to play at Florida? Four? That's it? I narrowed it down to four. I had plenty. But I, I narrowed it down to four fairly quickly. But, well, what was the four? When I went to Nebraska, Nebraska was the limit. Oh, hey, yeah. oh, what? Yeah, it, it was too cold. I went down. Okay, I understand that. <laughs> yeah. And, and being from Florida, it was just a no-go. And so, but uh, I knew I wasn't going to Florida State. So it bore down to Auburn and, and Florida. So, uh, my mom said I wasn't going to Alabama at all, so Florida was the only choice. It was the only choice I had. Okay, so Dirk, you uh, you go pro. You're, you're no I'm college. Gonna keep this really short. I didn't go to college. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but see, here's the thing: after 21 years with the Mavericks, whatever it is you don't know, you can hire people to explain it to you. you know, uh, <laughs> What, what's what I'm doing now? That's what, the pace what, I'm in now. Was there any, was there any thought, parents, uh, friends at all, or was it always you were going to be going uh, straight to the NBA? No, no. Actually, I was on, on a recruiting visit. I visited Stanford and Kentucky. Uh, Cal at the time uh, knew the coach. So I enjoyed my time there and had a good time. But after that one game that I had in the U.S., with a, it was the Hoop, uh, Hoop Heroes on uh, the Hoop Summit at the time, and I had a good game, and everybody said, basically your lottery now and so it's kind of hard to bypass that and everybody said if you could be lottery pick you got to go so I decided to go straight. Let me ask all of you this because uh, I'm always fascinated by this. How, how old were you when you first realized that you, you were just better at, at your games than anybody else? I mean I know you practiced at an early age writing your autograph did you not? Is that a true story? Right? Uh, yeah, that's and I think true. you were like but how, how old were you when you thought, I might be good enough to well, make my life out of it? I was, uh, I mean, I, I always say, uh, from as far back as I can remember, my father would ask me all the time, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, I, and I, I don't remember ever answering that question without saying, I want to be a professional athlete. I wasn't sure what the sport would be. Baseball was my first love growing up in Southern California. But I, I knew, I guess, uh, probably... You know, I hate to say this, but probably around nine or ten years old. I mean, I, I just knew. I didn't know in what in what capacity. I mean, I didn't know if I'd be the number one pick or anything like that. But I knew, 
I knew I was good enough that if I, if I stuck to it, I'd have a chance to try out for, for a professional team in some sport. So I was always motivated and driven to, to see that through. And, and uh, you know, hey, it's worked for me. I'm one of the fortunate guys in the, in, the, in the world to be able to live out a dream and see it all happen. But that's just it. It usually doesn't happen. How old are you? I was actually 10 as well. <clears throat> I was 10 uh, playing, and I was forced to play up a grade level uh, with 11 and 12-year-old guys. Uh, and at, at a grade level, uh, playing against 11 and 12-year-old guys, which are all bigger, faster. But I was able to compete with most of them and play at the level I, don't I know think what you're doing so. to your microphone. Yeah, you they don't want to hear me. But so you, you were ahead of the game, like you said, at 10, playing with 12 year olds. Yeah, yeah. You must have been doing the same thing in Germany, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, so I actually played a bunch of sports growing up. My dad was a handball player, which is a sport that's really not that common here, but it's pretty big in Germany. Uh, I played tennis. That was my first sport and my first love. Uh, I was a huge Boris Becker fan. Tennis? Huge Boris Becker fan, of course. Wait, hold on, hold, hold. No, no, we're not going to run okay. past that so okay. fast. <laughs> Did you have to like move to reach the baselines? And uh, uh, uh. I mean, I mean, I mean there, sir, were you good? I was decent. I mean, I was traveling around a little bit in Germany, played some tournaments, youth tournaments, and I was ranked in, in my area and there in Bavaria. So I mean, I was okay. I could have probably gone pro a little bit, but not obviously. Okay, so so I when did the basketball? The right all right, but then when did the basketball take over? Uh, it was about 12, 13 I started and really knew I was going somewhere. I was probably 13, 14. I was, like, I was taller, I could move, I was, I was liking it, I was getting better. And then I met this coach, the crazy coach that probably everybody knows by now. I met him when I was about 15 and then um, things was, was taken off. All right, Roger, how about you? I was probably turning uh, 17. I knew uh, my senior year at, at quarterback, it was a good year. So I knew that I pro probably could play in college and uh, it was important that I was uh, able to have a scholarship when I went to college. And of course, going to the Naval Academy was uh, is the, the, where I chose to go. And I felt that I could play uh, uh, I could play college football. Is his microphone on right there? No. Could you hear? Oh, oh that's right. You, yeah. They gave you the I handheld was, mic, and you don't hold it, for goodness sake. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, is that part of those concussions kicking in here for something? I mean. I knew well, there. I knew when there was, did you know? <laughs> when, when did you know you were going to be I, about big three time? Weeks ago. <laughs> about three weeks ago. I knew that. No, knew, this is what I always wanted to do too. I, I knew. I knew there was something yeah. wrong. I just didn't know what it was here. <laughs> <laughs> no, that my my right. my senior in, in high school uh, when I played quarterback. Really, I, I really believed I could play in college. So I was about 17 years old. But were you thinking NFL at that point? No. No? No. Okay. I, I watched the NFL uh, films, uh, A Football Life, last night. Uh, so I know for a fact Roger basically could be anything he wanted to be at any time. What if that dream, as you point out, it, the numbers are pretty staggering against you. What would you guys have done if the professional sports didn't work out? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, I have, I, I, I can say this where it gives a little bit more credibility to the answer. I mean, I, I've got a, a sister, I have two sisters who are nurses, and, and my, my middle sister, I'm the youngest, but the middle of the two, she runs, uh, she's a CEO of the hospital at St. Anthony's. Her son's uh, going through residency in Cincinnati. I, 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 I believe I would have gotten into the, the medical profession, and I always wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon, so uh, I, that's a, that's my go-to answer, and it's kind of like, well, well... I think we better stick with okay. football. Right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, hey, if, you're, if you ask the question... You, wait, hold on a second. <laughs> yeah, look look at these hands. Look at these hands. <laughs> How the hell are you going to hold a scalpel with hands like that? For God's sake. <laughs> you, you really thought about maybe, could have been, possibly? Yeah. You know, why not? We'll never know. No. <laughs> Thank God we won't. I think. But, uh, <laughs> what about you, Emmett? What, what if it hadn't been if it hadn't been for seventeen thousand plus yards? What would have happened to Emmett Smith? Well, I was looking for a way to get out of Pensacola, and so there was only two ways. One was football. The other way was through the military, naval base in Pensacola. I probably would have enlisted into the to the navy or something of that nature, just to get out of out of my hometown. You wanted out of Pensacola? I wanted out. I wanted out badly. Did you want out of Germany that bad, or? Uh, uh, no, nah, <laughs> not that bad. But actually, my, uh, my parents growing up had a painting business, 
a painting business. Believe it or not, painting houses inside, outside. So on vacation, really? school vacation, I used to work a little bit as a painter. And well, you just paint the ceilings without a ladder, for God's sake. I mean, it was just, I would have been. Think uh, of the money they could have saved here. Just... I would have probably been the world's tallest painter for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a day. There's not a day you end up doing that. Yeah, day. I try to get out. I try right. to get out. All right, but here's yeah. all right. When when you got drafted, somebody told me to ask this way. When, when you got drafted, uh, '99, uh, right? Uh, I mean, did you know any of these three? Did, did I mean, you know of them at all? We are more of a soccer country. Um, <laughs> real, that's real football to us. That's, you know, uh, <laughs> kidding, joke, joke. And by the way, I put soccer right below hockey. Uh, <laughs> That was a polite way of him saying no. He, had <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, didn't, he didn't know any of you guys. Right? No, no, it's not true. Of course, I followed sports all yeah. across the world. And but was Dallas, did Dallas turn out to be, and this is obviously for all of you as well, but um, would you have been uh, as successful as you, have, uh, as you were uh, if you'd have been drafted, say, by the Washington Wizards or, or some such thing. Did, did Dallas make Dirk Nowitzki or did Dirk Nowitzki make the Mavericks or a little bit of both? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I was lucky uh, to come in a system where obviously we, I don't know how you buy basketball knowledge is, but Coach Nelly was perfect for me. Um, he, was a, he was a mismatch, matcher, ma mismatch master. Uh, he played different styles. He wanted his big guys to shoot and spread the floor. And, uh, he was he was way beyond his, his time, and so that perfectly fit fit my system and my my style of play. And, um, so I was I was very fortunate to come in a system that uh, supported me and wanted me to play my way. And if I would have gone somewhere else, I don't know, they probably would have bought me up. And back then, there was still a lot of big guys and lifting a lot of weights uh, at the end of the 90s. And uh, I don't know, maybe my I would have never uh, actually played the way I did now. So if say the Cincinnati Bengals with their great, great success, uh, had drafted Emmett Smith. What would Emmett Smith have accomplished? Uh, we, we'll never know. <laughs> we'll never know because that didn't happen. But if we had to go on a hypothetical, I would have thought that Cincinnati would have won at least one championship by now. <laughs> oh, you know what we're doing. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I'm laughing, I, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going I'm to call you out on this one. I'm going to bust you on this one. We did a, a deal a couple of years, or about a year or two, I guess it was, and I asked Emmett what would happen if he were drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals, and Emmett's answer then was, well, I, you probably wouldn't have ever heard of Emmett Smith. Uh, uh, I certainly wouldn't have rushed for 17,000 yards. I turned to Aikman, and I said, well, what would have happened if you'd been drafted by, say, the Cleveland Browns, and you said... We would have won a few Super Bowls. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, hey, I will, I will say that when I got to Dallas, we were the worst team in football. And when, when Emmett got to the Cowboys, we were the worst team in football. And so, it, it, you know, Dallas wasn't exactly the place that you wanted to be at the time that, that we were being drafted. We have a lot of people to, to thank for our successes. And... And probably at the top of that list is, is Jimmy Johnson in, in bringing us all together. So, um, you know, I, I, I think the Dallas thing, though, to that point is, I know Jimmy, he said at the time, players were leaving their, their uh, teams and, and going wherever they spent the offseason. That was the norm at the time that we came into the league, especially if you're in a northern city, you want to get out to the Florida, California, places where it's warm, Texas, Arizona. Jimmy made it clear that you were going to be there in the off season. And I think that he may, if Jimmy had taken a job in, you know, I don't know, Green Bay or somewhere like that, would players have stayed? I, I'm not so sure they would have, but Dallas is such a great town. I mean, I, I love Dallas. It's my home. It has been for 30 years or whatever it's been. And and, and Jimmy said, if you don't stay here in the offseason, you're not going to be on this team. Well, that, that's, that's not, that wasn't a real hard sell because most guys were staying anyway. And so I think from that standpoint, uh, a lot of players leave Dallas, the Cowboys. They still reside here in, in this community. And I think it says a lot for the city. And, and uh, I know Dirk is still spending time here, even though he's from Germany. And, 
and uh, kind of going back and forth. Between, you know, Roger's been here all these years, Emmett's still here, and could go through a whole list of guys, and it's because of this community. So I, I don't want to take anything away from the city. The city's had a huge part of, of our successes, along with a lot of individuals who helped make it happen. Also, Roger, yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. I'd how, how realistic was it that you might have, you might have actually ended up in Kansas City? Uh, when you were being drafted by Kansas City and the Cowboys. Yeah, when I was, uh, it was 1963, I was still at the Naval Academy, and they, they had two different, two leagues, and I was drafted by Dallas and Kansas City, and they both had an interest that if I ever decided to play again, you know, when you're young, four years seems like an eternity, but uh, they both talked to me about playing, uh, if I played for Kansas City or Dallas, so I signed a commitment to play for uh, the Dallas Cowboys, and uh, and that was a smart move because Lenny Dawson stayed on for a long time after I, I got out, and Don Merrith retired. I was um, leaving the service, and Kurt Moser called and said that Don Merrith retired. I thought it was a joke, you know, I thought he was just kidding, but he he retired, and so I, I became Craig Morton's backup quarterback. If he would have stayed, Don Don could have played another five years. Don Merrith was a heck of a quarterback, really, and. And so I was fortunate to have a chance. Uh, so Craig and I battled back and forth for a few years. Well, you mentioned uh, you and Craig Morton battling back and forth. One of the people asked me to ask this question. Uh, how big a fan were you of Tom Landry's idea of alternating quarterbacks on the plays with you and Morton running in and out? Well, when he announced that, I, uh, I thought he had a stroke. Uh, <laughs> He, I'll just he, set him up for you, Roger. I'll uh, just set him up for you. No, no, he, he didn't have a stroke, by the way, but he, uh, <laughs> that, that was a bit unusual. And, it, it, you know, the team, Coach Landry was the best. For 20 years, we won. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 I, and, and I love Coach Landry, but he had a hard time because the, the team was divided. The quarterback still, the players have to be behind the quarterback. You've got to have confidence as a quarterback, but you've got to transfer it to your teammates, too. And so it was, a, I think half the team wanted Craig and half the team wanted me. And it was, it was a difficult situation. Uh, and, but that's where the coach wanted to do it and, and it lasted about half the season. Okay, you played all those years with Landry. You played with Jimmy Johnson and whoever came after that. Uh, you did. Um, what, about, what about your coaches? I mean, you had Don Nelson, Avery Johnson, and, and Rick Carlisle. I mean, that's, that's three pretty good basketball coaches, right? So which, which, one is, which one is the best one of the bunch? Uh, that's, that's tough, but it's actually unusual in 21 years to only have really three coaches if you look what's going on in, in all the leagues now. So I was lucky or fortunate to only play with for three great coaches. I think all of them are a little different. Their personalities are different. Their, their styles are a little different. I think Nelly was a loose guy and everybody, you know, shoot, no rules. Uh, then <laughs> Avery came and it was very structured. And then I think when Rick came, uh, he sort of kind of like took a middle ground. There was, there was some structure, but there's also free play. He gave Jay Kidd a lot of freedom. Um, so I think if I, if I would, you know, say who's where, I think Rick is kind of right in the middle of, of the other two. Okay. I will get to some of these other questions, but I got two more of my own that I have to ask. What is um, so hard about retiring? Uh, I, you probably don't remember this, but uh, your rookie year, you and I were playing golf at Trophy Club. We were on the second hole, uh, second tee box, and I said something about how long you're going to play or something. You said, I'm going to quit before I'm 30. You remember this? Mm. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Nod your head like you remember. Yeah, okay. uh, but you actually said to me, and I, I told you, I'll take any bet you want to make that you will not retire before you're 30. You said, I guarantee you I will. Every one of you teared up. Uh, you went to Arizona for a year, I guess, just to check out the dry heat or something, I guess. <laughs> but what is it? What is it that makes it so hard to walk away from the game? And let me start down here at the end again. Because uh, I just, I saw your teary farewell the other night. Well, I was 27 as a rookie, so I was g turning 38, and I had a, a few concussions. So, uh, and we had a really good quarterback to take over for Danny White. So I, I really missed it, though. I, I missed just the, the the adrenaline rush that you have before the game, and so it was it was tough retiring. Uh, 
and it, but I think I, I had to do it. And it, but I, I had a chance to play 11 years, and and uh, I was very fortunate to get those 11 years in. And you were coming off back surgeries, concussions, uh, 34, I think 35. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you did you weren't you didn't really want to quit, did you? Well, it was uh, not not. Not especially. I mean, I had given some thought to maybe going elsewhere and, and, and playing. I think the, the, a lot of people point to the concussions as to why I retired. If there was an injury involved, it had really more to do with my back. You're right. I, I had back surgery. I was having some shots my last season to try to even get out onto the field. And not taking anything away from the head injuries because I had a few of those as well. But that wasn't a, a, a big component in the decision. There were, it, it ran a lot deeper. I, I was frustrated with a lot of things that were happening within the organization. And so uh, I, I was ready to, to move on. I was ready to move on from Dallas uh, and maybe, you know, kick the tires on another organization. And uh, I think, the, you know, it was an emotional time for me. I think the, you know, you start this game when you're a kid. You just start, you know, many of you played and you got kids who are playing and, you know, with the, you know, the innocence of playing sports and and then to have it parlay into an occupation to where you get paid for doing it and get paid well and, and make amazing relationships and then have the successes that we were able to have. When, when that comes to an end, uh, it, it, it's a hard thing to kind of put your arms around as to, to what you're going to do. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a fairly emotional guy anyway, so that, that, was, that was really hard. I, you know, I cried when you retired. And, and uh, so, <laughs> but wait, oh, that's right, you haven't retired yet. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> But I, I will retire, or I will cry when you retire, when that day comes, so. Well, a lot of people think I have retired. Um, and the reason I'm wearing the tuxedo tonight is because I am working part-time now. Uh, we, we've had some cutbacks at Channel 8, but I've, I've got to get over to Bob's Steakhouse because I handle the late well, city yeah. over there. I mean, uh, <laughs> I was hoping it was at Bob's it, it, rather oh, than somewhere it's going to be else. Bob. You know it's going to be Bob. <laughs> right. But but you you after and you were surprisingly healthy, I think, as as, as I remember it anyway. Uh, but but you couldn't walk away. You wanted to go do at least one more shot in Arizona. Uh, why? What what was what was so hard about realizing your time is up? Um, I, similar to what Troy has said. I mean, <laughs> you 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 play this game uh, because number one, you love the sport and you want to see how good you can become. And you go through the whole entire process of uh, little league, high school, then college, and then you finally make it to the pinnacle of being a professional athlete, and you're around on some of the best of the best in the entire country in this sport. And, and you pin yourself up against these guys, and he's like, do I really me measure up? And can I do and become the best version of myself within this sport? And so when it gets to the end, the hard thing for me was watching guys like Troy and Michael uh, and, and Charles Haley and Daryl Johnson, guys leave the sport before me. Because I've never envisioned them leaving the sport before me. I've envisioned us all leaving at the same time. And so when that started happening, a part of you start to leave. Because like Troy talked about it earlier, when we first got here, the Cowboys was at the bottom of the barrel. And then when you build something- Kind of like they are now. Well. <laughs> When you build something special, when you build something special, you want to hold on to it forever. You want to still, hold on to still it forever. Roger. You're still with me, Roger. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I'm, Roger's making me laugh. He yeah. made me say it. So you want to build on, you want to hold on to it forever. And, and so when you get to the end, the thing that, you know, people always talk about prepare for retirement, prepare for this. But when you get to the end, it's like, what's next? And the next is the unknown. Everything else you've done has been progress what you know. and, and what you know. And now is in the unknown. And the unknown can be very difficult because how you fit in the unknown is yet to be seen. So you have to figure out how to make these life adjustments themselves because we've always have had someone have, give us a schedule. Now we have no schedule. Now we have nobody managing our processes. Now we have to develop these new processes for ourselves in order to find meaning to the rest of life outside of just this mm. sport, because this sport meant a lot to us. So when you cry, at the end, it's like, man, I've been playing this thing since I was seven years old. Now I'm never going to play this sport ever again. What's next? A dose of reality hits you, but you come to learn quickly 
when you hang around guys like Roger Starback and you see others and you watch them transitioning from the sport, you learn that it's something that's going to happen to everybody. And you now have to start being prepared for it, even when you don't want to let it go. And for me, going to Arizona gave me a chance to truly realize that, first of all, why am I in Arizona? <laughs> Secondly, what else can I do? I yeah. mean, how many more yards can I get? What does that mean? Thirdly, if I hang around any further, I'm going to get hurt real bad. <laughs> and then the fourth part is, this is truly a young man's sport. And my body cannot take any more hits. So going to Arizona gave me an opportunity to have closure and say, I'm done with this. I have nothing else to prove. It's behind me. Once I'm done, I don't ever want to look back over my shoulder and say, what if? Or should I have stayed another year? All that was <coughs> out of my system, and it helped me move forward cleanly. Yeah, wow, that's really good. That's really good. Go ahead, try to top that, Dirk. I'm going I'm to keep it short. Um, you know, I basically knew last year was already it. Uh, I was having foot problems. Uh, it was taking the fun away. Uh, and the whole year I already knew this was going to be my last year. And how much, even how much you think about it, you're still going to be emotional when, when, when the time comes. And I'll never forget my, the last week preparing, uh, putting my, the, the jersey on one last time at home. I'll never forget the last home game. And uh, it's just, uh, it still brings, uh, brings goosebumps, obviously, to, to my skin. I mean, it's only been, what, eight months now. So it's, it's still all pretty fresh. And all that Emmett has talked about, I'm going through now, trying to obviously find my routine, find my rhythm, enjoy my kids, travel and then find something uh, that I enjoy for, for the rest of my life. So uh, I'm in that period now, and, but so far I'm, I'm enjoying it, and, um, but leaving something that you love uh, is definitely hard, but as we, I'm sure we all do, I'm gonna stick around my sport. Uh, the sport has given me so much since I was 14, 15 years old. I've been traveling around the world, uh, meeting so many cool people and relationships, so uh, give me a few years off and uh, I'll, I'll be around the game. Cool. Yeah, wow. This, uh, th this is the one constant you, you, you heard from all four. I mean, Roger was, was being literally knocked out uh, in football games. Troy had the concussions in the back. Emmett was trying to avoid a massive injury, landed on his head in Chicago, and, and the foot injuries he had. Do you think the average fan, despite all the talk about the dangers and the, the, the injuries uh, in the sports, maybe a little more so in football, but basketball has an incredible wear and tear. Um, do you think the fans still understand and appreciate what you guys go through to play your games? Uh, probably not. I mean, um, and nor should they. I don't, I don't, I mean, I just don't think you truly appreciate the collisions and, and the, the toll it takes on a body, you know, unless you've actually been through it. And I think there's some frustration on fans' parts with the changes in the rules and player safety and, I think fans are all for it. I think everybody's for safety, but but uh, I, I can only imagine. I hear from a lot of people, a lot of fans, when calls are made and and they don't. They, hey, this isn't the way the game used to be played, and, and all yeah, that but, goes. But if, that. if you if you and Roger played under the rules they have today, you'd both still be playing. Well, um, I would be. I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know about Roger. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know Roger wants Roger, to. Roger had hip replacement a I, couple weeks ago. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, used to, I used to run and slide, and they could spear you. And at the end of my career, they put that rule in there. If you slid, you couldn't touch the quarterback. So, yeah. so I, I like so the you, new rules. You, you know, like the rules now, though? Oh, yeah. Well, we, we're, we're, we'll see yeah. guys like we are. I mean, the Breezes, the Bradys, the, the, the quarterbacks, more quarterbacks than others. But the quarterbacks playing into their early 40s is going to become the norm. I mean, it's just they're not getting hit like they once were. No. You've, got, you've got a son uh, who, who's actually a, a pretty good football player. Uh, are you okay with, with your boy playing? I mean, are you, are you a fan of him playing the game, or do you have some reservations Without about it? Without a doubt, I'm a fan of him playing the game. Uh, I love watching him play. I am about as nervous as any other parent is up in the stands. Um, I, I, I'm concerned just like anyone else. But the one thing I've learned, Dale, in life is you cannot take the passion away from someone else. They have to come to that conclusion themselves that this is not for me. And he has to go through the whole process. My job as a parent with the experience of being in professional sports is to be there when something bad happened, to analyze and help him work his way through that piece and listen to what the doctors are saying and, 
and understand and ask the right questions to the doctors and challenge them and so forth. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm cool because one thing I love about our sport, you absolutely have to love it to play it because it doesn't have any good meaning. What makes sense about our sport? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. I mean, how can you make sense out of running into a 355-pound guy or getting hit in the back, having to have to have hip surgery, neck concussions and all this stuff, foot injuries? That doesn't make That's not normal. That's not normal. So what we do is not normal, but we love what we do. So you absolutely got to love it in order to appreciate it from the perspective which we do from our side because that's the only way we play sports like this and play it at the level that we're playing it at. It's not because of the dollars. It's because I love for it and I love for our teammates because we all go through the same thing. We all prepare ourselves very similar. We, we focus, we commit ourselves, and we go out and we give it our best. And we challenge ourselves every day just like the men and women of our armed services are challenging themselves every oh, day. Oh, all right. Ah. Every day. Ah. Every day. Yeah. And so with that said, Woo. Come, I'm, I'm come, hey, go, go ahead. Just stand up and kiss up big. Hey, come on, baby. Hey, come on. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm here to support my kid. Yeah. All of my kids or whatever they want to do. I'm never going to tell them that you can't. My mom told me that never to use that word because you can do whatever you want to do. If you set your mind and heart and soul to it, you can do it. And so I'm there to push them and, and be right there and support them and cheer them on. And when something go bad, let's figure out what's going wrong. Let's get you to the appropriate doctors and let's move forward. I just want to say, I think this is the greatest crowd I've ever had the opportunity to work in front of in my entire life. I, it didn't work for me, I didn't get the pay. Which, which is, uh, how do I say this? Uh, is, is the winning, um, enough to offset the pain of the losing. And, and Merton Hanks from the 49ers, you remember him? Uh, he, 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 not very many people do. But, but, but Merton Hanks is, Merton Hanks from the 49ers is here. Was winning the Super Bowl uh, as enjoyable uh, and as much fun, uh, or was it the pain of losing uh, the year in, uh, what, 94, was it? Uh, did you say Merton was here? Yeah, yeah, he's sitting back there. Hey, Merton, how are you, bud? What's up, Merton? There right you go. Yeah. We got a 49 in the house. Yeah. He's one of the, uh, one of the. Well, one they, of they, didn't, they didn't have a victory parade, so they, he was free to get here. They didn't yeah. have to celebrate out here. So. One, of the, one of the really great players and, and great people. So, Merton, welcome to Dallas. Um, I, I think that what, what happened for me anyway and, uh, is that the, when, you, when I came to Dallas in 89, we were 1 and 15, and, or 3 and 13, 1 and 15 my rookie year, not very good. And, and then that ascent uh, to winning a, a world championship and being on top, that was a, that was a, it was an amazing ride and each step along the way, and there was a lot of heartache that came with it. But when we finally got it done, the, the sense of accomplishment and achievement was, was so overwhelming. I mean, it was, a, it, and, and, but yet once you do that the first time, uh, and I'm sure Merton would feel the same way, once you do it the first time, it, it, it is never the same because then that became the expectation and, and doing it the first time, you only obviously get to do it once. So even though we climbed that mountain a couple more times, each one, although special, was not quite with the innocence that the first one was. And, yeah. and I just remember that, yeah, to answer your question, the wins uh, were not enough to, to make up for the, the, the disappointment of losing. You know, I mean, you were, you were obsessed with the losses, demoralized by the losses, and the wins you just kind of took for granted and expected. And, and it, that's unfortunate, you know. I mean, I think that's in all business. I think that's just the way life is. But, but, but Dirk, you had, um, uh, I think it was 07, when you had Miami, you should have won that series. 06. You're up two games, or 06. Um, but then Miami comes back, wins four in a row. But then you come back in 2011 and, and you win. Now that you're out of the game, do you think about the win or do you think even a little bit more about the one that got away? Well, I personally think there is no win without all the losses. Um, I think over 10 years, every time you, you're disappointed, you're ending the season on a loss with a playoff loss. Um, and it's just super frustrating, but that pushed me really. It pushed me in the off season to work harder. In my 20s, if I took two weeks off in the summer, that was long. I was already back in the gym again. 
working hard and, um, and trying to get better and, and be a better player, better person. And I always say I wouldn't have been the closer and finisher in 2011 without all the losses, and especially the one in 06. I know you remember almost every game you played. Which way, which way do you look at it, Roger? Uh, hey, I think that's really, really a, a good question because the, the, um, we, we had 11 winning seasons. We won a couple of Super Bowls, but we lost, especially the, the second one, we lost to Pittsburgh 20, 21 to 17, and we were, we were really a wild card team. We were building at that time in 75, but the second time we played it, we lost 35-31. So I, I really go out to play to win and do everything to get ready to win. And that's what players have to do today is, is they got to work hard. They got to look at the game. They got to get ready to win and not just to go out there to play. And, and so I, I, I think a lot about losing that game when you ask that question. <laughs> think, oh, yeah. Uh, losing to the Steelers 35, they were really a good team, but we were good too that year. We, we had got Dorsett and Tony Hill. We added on to the team. It was a, we had a really good team that year. So that, that was a uh, – I, I, I think about that loss more do you, than I do, do my you, uh, uh, Do you still remember all the scores of the games that you played? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, but I bet you so, he has a lot of losses that stands out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we both do. I mean – I mean, winning, like Troy said, sometimes you become numb to the fact or your expectations there. When you have a great team, you have the tendency to think, well, we're going to win this game. And then when you have a loss, you're like, what happened? How did this team beat us? How did we lose to Atlanta? How did we lose to the Bills in the regular season? How do you lose to a Redskins team that's, that came married? Well, they lost to the Bills in the regular season because you were holding out for that money you said you didn't care about. <laughs> First and foremost, first and foremost, first and foremost, we into that. I'm sorry. we're going to defuse this lie he just told. <laughs> I never held out. I didn't have a contract. No, no, the work. Yeah, so yeah. if you don't have a contract, how is that holding out? I stand correct. You are unemployed. <laughs> Only in our sport, they say you hold out for more money. But when you're unemployed, they say, well, he's negotiating. I think you hit a nerve. You hit a nerve. <laughs> I, I might have kept that one to myself. When you lie in bed or not, I ask this. Let me drop a name since you guys have been dropping them on me. Uh, I asked this to President Obama last year. Uh, yes, I was there. I sat down with President Obama. Uh, I met, and I also met that same day I met President Obama. Uh, later that day, I met Stormy Daniels. <laughs> it's true. And, and since I do work and live in such a conservative uh, state, uh, I, paid, I paid President Obama $130,000 not to tell anybody. <laughs> when you... Now, I got to wait for the whole room to figure that out. That, I'm sorry, that's funny. Now, that's funny. That's funny. Thank you, Evan, I know it. But I'm serious about it. When you, when you lie in bed, and I said this to you when you called back immediately when I sent you the email, you haven't thrown a ball in 40 years uh, that, that people really care about. Uh, I mean, I know you threw one I to your You probably grand threw one earlier today. I'm playing a lot of flag football games. I'm happy for you. I'm happy for you. <laughs> but, but it's been 40 years since you threw a ball that most people care about. Uh, it's been... Gosh, what, 20 years, this doesn't seem possible, uh, 20 years uh, for the two of you, uh, and granted only eight months, but what, what you accomplished was amazing for a town that, that is not a basketball town until you seriously, in my opinion, almost single-handedly put them on the map. So, when, when you lie in bed at night, at, do you ever find yourself just looking up at the ceiling and thinking to yourself, yes, I'm Roger Staubach and the rest of the world is not. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, you seriously don't think? It's crossed your mind. <laughs> Evidently. <laughs> yeah, oh, hold on. Wait. Try it again. Oh. Yeah. There you go. You're right. He's uh, messing around with my mic here. Yeah. yeah. But you, so you say no. you don't think that way? Not really, no. Nope. No. Yes, Evans you do. No. Yes, you do. Evans, no. 
I don't at all. I mean, I, hey, my, my, my athletic career, uh, the Cowboys career, college, whatever, I mean, it was all, it was great. I mean, I, and, uh, and I don't mind getting up here and, and talking about it. I made some great relationships. I lived out a dream, as I said earlier, and accomplished a lot, a lot more than I ever thought that I would when I, you know, started in this journey. But, uh, I mean, I don't give a lot of thought to my playing career, you know, and I, I just had someone reach out to me and they wanted to talk about the Jimmy Jerry situation from 25 years ago. I said, who cares? You know, I mean, it's just, it's just, uh, my, my football life was great, but it's, it's kind of over and done with. And I said, even back then, I hope that as I get older, I hope that I'm still not talking about what I did 25, 30, 40 years ago. I mean, uh, and you've heard me say this. I mean, I my most important thing is is being a dad to my girls, and and when and when they when they, you know, I, I said it in my football life. When when my that our family is going to tell our story. Not, you know, nothing against the fans. I love the fans. I love the the support that the Cowboys have, but they're not going to tell my story. My my family is, and I and I hope if, if my girls say, hey, he was a great dad, then then I'm Win. pretty pretty content. I don't need the Hall of Fame. I don't need any of that stuff. So. Wow. Get, see, you, out of all of the accomplishments here, uh, somebody will pass Dirk in the, the scoring title, and uh, apparently Luka Doncic in the next three years, if I understand it correctly. Um, but I don't think anybody, because the way the game has changed, I don't think anybody will ever break your all-time NFL rushing record. All right. do, well, you, do you ever just lie there and think about, yeah, yeah, I, am, I really am pretty cool? No, no. <laughs> You know, because I believe just like Troy, really do. And I think the thing about most athletes, we did what we were able to do, and we we're pleased with what we were able to accomplish. All the other stuff is for people that have not achieved that level of greatness. <laughs> and so you have not achieved that level of greatness, you sit back and talk about it all the time. <laughs> See, we don't like to talk now, about it. We now, want new things to now, talk about. Now, we want now, you, now your microphone works. Well, Great. Now, you, <laughs> but you were on Ellen, weren't you? I was on oh, Ellen. On. Yes. On. Was a... Yes, I was. Have you been on the Ellen DeGeneres show? <laughs> yes. No. Oh, well, well, well. All right, let me, let me try this. Last a couple of questions I asked people at, at, at Channel 8. I thought both of them were incredible. Uh, if you could have one guy to play with, and at the same time, let me kind of make this a twofer as we go around. We got just a few minutes here. Uh, kind of a twofer question. A, if you could have one teammate from any period of time, uh, long ago, now, whatever, to join your team, who would it be? And at the same time, who was the guy on the other side, or like in your case, Dirk, that you went up against, that you said, oh, this is going to be a long day. This, this is going to be an uncomfortable day. Roger, go first, please. Oh, boy. The, uh, I guess it would be Freddie DeFinney. Be what? It was my, <laughs> se my senior year in high school. I switched, was switched to quarterback. We played the opening what? game. We're losing at the end of the game. And if we lose that game, I, I lose. My job will go to Tom Schneeman. So I throw a touchdown pass to Freddie DeFinney, or I wouldn't even be here right now. <laughs> Thank you, Freddie Finney. Yeah, Freddie Finney. So who, who, who was the guy, who was the guy that said, okay, this is going to be a bad day, going to be a long day, because he's on the other side of the, of the ball? Dyron Talbert, I'm assuming? Uh, Dyron Talbert would be at the, uh, close to the top of the list, yes. Yeah, and there's Washington. Uh, Washington uh, mean Joe Green, there's a, uh, Mean Joe Green's actually, a, a, he's not mean off the field, but he's mean on the field. Yeah. And yeah, there's a, I could, Go on and on about the great. Roger, defense. your team, your, your teammate. Pick a teammate from all time. Who would you want? My teammate. Yeah. To play with me again. My yeah, that, that was the question. Yeah, that's the third time. Well, I, not, I mean, you're, I'm saying, yeah. I, if you're asking me any player of any of any guy, you know, I would I would say uh, Jack Lambert is who I wish I would have. I always wish that I'd gotten a chance to to play with him. I think if you're talking about Cowboys. Uh, when I came in in 89, I came in with Jimmy and Jerry, and so there were a lot of changes, of course, being made. Ed Tuttle Jones stayed one more year, so I got to play with him, 
which meant which meant a lot. I mean, I was I was honored because I was watching him when I was when I was young. The guy who I wish had stayed, but he left, was Randy White. Oh, he always, was yeah. I'd always uh, I'd always wish I had a chance to to say that I played for Randy White, and I always you know as great as Jimmy was for us. I, I do wish, people ask me all the time because of the timing of when I came in with Jimmy and Jerry, uh, if I ever played with Tom Landry, and, and, and he is, uh, he, I wish that I could have at least played one year for Coach Landry. And uh, who bothered you on the other side? Uh, you know, I'd say probably, uh, probably Lawrence Taylor, and, and, and he was, he was come, you know, when I came in, he was still good, and then he was kind of on the tail end a little bit, but you know, we played against Reggie White and some really great players, but I, I will tell you, our offensive line, like Reggie White was never much of a factor in, in our games because of our offensive line. So I never went in really all that concerned with whoever they had because I, I wasn't going to, you know, like some of these quarterbacks, I wasn't going to get hit like a lot of those guys. <laughs> so I was blessed. A lot there. of that occurred early in your career. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, LT got years. me. LT got me a few times my rookie year for sure. <laughs> you have you have a particular teammate you'd like to have played with? Um, <clears throat> I played with the best, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, <laughs> but I'm man, like this Tro man is on a I, roll tonight. I'm, I'm like Troy though. I would have loved to have had a chance to play for Coach Landry at least one year, just so I could say I played for Coach Landry. Um, yeah, but you got to play with Barry Switzer, so it's kind of the same thing. Isn't it? Not quite. No, not, not quite, quite either. Not no. quite. But, no, uh, you know, the, the man with the historic hat walking around on the sideline. Yeah. Just Who scared you on the other side of the ball? Mary Smith, which was my mother. I had it. <laughs> I mean, facing her was like facing the LT, you know. <laughs> it's like, she was worse. I mean, she, I was. Mean, she was worse. I mean, how can you get hit by a woman that loves you like this? But you expect LT. <laughs> They hit you with no love, you know. You respect that. That's just, just, it's just different. See, I, think I think this has potential for you, Dirk, because of the, of this, the, the, this five on five nature of basketball. Do you have a particular teammate from all time that you like that, that you would have liked to have been there with? Well, you know, I grew up in the, in the '90s watching basketball, and of course, that was Michael Jordan's era and time, and so I was. That was obviously the goat, and I was. I was fortunate. That he came back with the Wizards uh, to compete against him. I was part of uh, his last All Star game in Atlanta when he made that famous fadeaway at the end. So um, that was obviously always part of my journey. One thing that people don't uh, all remember is uh, played with Dennis Rodman for two, three weeks. Uh, that was uh, that was interesting. Uh, I remember. Uh, so Mark Cuban had just bought the team, and it was obviously we weren't very good in the late 90s. And he's like, I got to make a splash. What should I do? And so he brought in, uh, he brought in Rodman, and uh, that was, uh, I, I can always tell my kids about uh, some of the stuff we saw those two, three weeks. But <laughs> Do you blame, uh, somebody asked me this question, too. Do you blame Cuban for blowing up the team after you won that championship? Well, I, I blame a little bit of the, the lockout. Um, I think there were some business decisions being made um, that he, he read a little bit wrong, he thought. Um, the cap space is the way to go, and it came around. You actually needed assets. So I think if, uh, if the lockout wouldn't have come on, we would have signed most of the guys back, and we would have had another chance. But uh, with, with the lockout, uh, we made some decisions that uh, obviously we regretted afterwards. Okay, I got just uh, two more questions. One, the, fan, the fascination with the rings and uh, uh, the great Arnold Payne, one of the, the best sports photographers ever, wanted me to ask you guys, is there anything that you would give up your ring for? You know, we see a lot of these rings and the like being sold on eBay nowadays and the like. Um, do you have do you have your three rings? I do, yeah. Uh, yeah no, I wouldn't give mine up. I I always thought that. <clears throat> I guess if you fall on real hard times, and and there has been some of those guys who have who have sold their rings, and I, I think that's understandable. But uh, I I would never uh, get rid of my rings. I think there are some there are some memorabilia that I have that I would be willing to part with. Uh, some of which I have. Uh, which I'm told, hey, my girls will want it. I'm thinking, really, what are they going to want from this stuff? But the ring, I always, you know, that's what we played for. And I always thought if we ever won a Super Bowl, I'd wear my Super Bowl ring everywhere I went. And, uh, 
and, and there are a few teammates, I won't name who they are, but they actually do wear them everywhere they go. I mean, they, wear, they, they wear them to the gym and they wear them everywhere else. And, they probably uh, take a shower I, in them and everything. I, 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 I don't, I, you can probably guess who some of them are, but yeah. um, I, I never wear mine. I occasionally wear it in the broadcast booth. I used to wear it only yeah. in the broadcast booth. Then I stopped wearing it. I, I wore it a couple times this year. But otherwise, I, I think just knowing you have it was enough for me, so I, I don't wear it. Where are your rings at? Do you, you have them? Yes, I do. And yeah. would, you, would you consider giving them up? I would consider giving them up. Yeah. Uh, because at the end of the day, they may mean more to someone else. I got the memories. I got the relationships. I got the things that, that holds true and dear to me. The rings is a symbol of, <clears throat> of, of an accomplishment, without a doubt. But the memories that I have with the guys that I play with will last me forever, even to the point where yeah. if I can't remember nothing, those are the things I'm going to remember right. before I lose my memory. Yeah, you mentioned so, yeah, you so, mi I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. So, yeah, I mean, everything that, that I've had that I was able to accomplish on the football field, I, I'm not tied to them that, like that. I'm not tied to them like that. For some right. reason, I don't well, know. Well, you, you mentioned playing with great guys. I forgot to ask this earlier, but uh, you had like, what, 174 rushing uh, touchdowns. 174. Isn't it true that you got 159 of them because Michael Irvin got tackled at the one? Not quite 159. <laughs> maybe, maybe Michael got tackled at the one probably 10, 15 times. <laughs> but you have your ring? Uh, I mean, a special place? Yeah, I have it at home. And obviously, special, yeah, special. Not, you, you're not would, giving it up? No. I've, I've, of course, like Troy said, if, if my family would ever fall on hard times, it would be the first thing, of course. But uh, if not, no, that's something I always wanted and dreamed of and watched, uh, you know, the ring presentations for years. And um, so I'll always keep mine. And it's actually funny when, when, when we won and Mark was like, I want to do something different, you know. I'm thinking about a bracelet or a foot bracelet. <laughs> and I'm looking like, are you out of your mind? Like... It's, it's got to be. It's this classic. It's just, everybody has it. And uh, so we finally talked him into doing a ring, and it's the greatest thing. <laughs> a bracelet. He wanted to do a bracelet. I said, you're out of your mind. Roger, what'd you do? What, what have you done with your two rings? They're in a safe. <clears> and <throat> uh, the um, couple of times, it's twice, actually, that uh, I got a call that uh, someone said they got my ring. And they, what they did, Balfour put my name on it. Is the, you know, the, just the, the, uh, pull it, the, pull it, put it to your mouth. Yeah, the Gal, Balfour put my, <laughs> put my name on the ring, that you know, just to show, show. And it wasn't my ring. I mean, it was not I had my <clears> ring yeah. safe. Wow. So I was, uh, I thought uh, a couple times they were, uh, someone had uh, taken my rings. So he what? has his ring sitting on top of his Heisman Trophy. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I got the, the Heisman on my hood of my car. <laughs> Sean, want me to ask you, um, if, uh, if somebody does this, say, uh, 30 years from today, uh, and obviously it won't be me sitting here in the middle, uh, but if somebody does this 30 years from today, um, uh, I think without question, Roger's still going to be on uh, uh, Mount Rushmore. You agree? You'll be there, right? <clears throat> I, I love putting him on a file like this. I don't I, know why I'm on there. <laughs> yeah. I think without question, ladies and gentlemen, and I make no apologies for this, uh, Brian Damaris, Leander Johnson, Judge Moyer, and me basically decided who the Mount Rushmore was. And you're looking at him, ladies and gentlemen. A big round of applause if you would. The Mount Rushmore of Dallas. All right, we're going to auction. Oh. We're just going to auction off the jersey real fast. Let's take it out, okay? All right, let's... We're just going to auction. We're going to auction off the jerseys real fast, and then you guys will just sign them for it backstage out the door you go, all right? All right, we have... Oh, get a group shot. Yeah, please. <laughs> he wants the Michael Bloomberg box. Here he's at. Right, br bring the lights up for me if you can. Here's what we're going to do very quickly because I want to get these guys out. They've been kind enough to give us their time on a Saturday night. It's amazing. We're going to auction off four of their jerseys, one jersey apiece. You will come up on stage. You will get your picture taken with the jersey and the player, and they will take you backstage and personally autograph the jersey for you.
And did I mention this is for Heroes on the Water? So open your heart. Down and a half. Sure if anybody needs a paddle to do the auction. All right, well, let's just get the lights up. We'll see where we're at, yeah. Can we get the lights up in the room? <clears throat> open up your hearts, reach into your pocket, and let's help these incredible military veterans. And again, show a little homage to these men for giving up their time by doing it. All right. Roger, Ro where's Roger's jersey first? We know we're getting close to Roger's bedtime, so let's do this one first. Where is it? Do I have it? Doesn't matter. Give me $500. Where you at? $500 for Roger's jersey. I got five. I, a thousand. Where's a thousand? A thousand dollars. Holler out. I got a thousand. Fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred, sir. I got fifteen hundred. Back to you for two thousand. Two thousand I got. Twenty-five hundred. I'm looking for twenty-five hundred. I've got two thousand. Twenty-five hundred. Where? Right here? Who are you pointing at? I need more light in the room. I got twenty-five hundred? Oh, okay. Right. Twenty-five hundred. I'm looking for three thousand. Three. Th who bet? Who bet the two thousand dollars? All right, you bet $2,000. We're talking you go to $3,000. That's $1,000 with the new Trump tax cut. You write that off. You only cost you $7.84. $3,000. I got $2,500. I need $3,000 once. I ain't gonna make it. Do I have $3,000? Do I have $3,000 twice? I need to hit the restroom. Where's what? I'm not gonna be able to hold it. You wanna buy your own jersey for $3,000? I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you what I'll do. You give me 3,500. You give me 3,500. I'll sell it to you right now. 3,500. Unless, of course, unless, of course, Roger's willing to pay four. 3,500 once, twice, sold for $3,500. You're awesome. Man. You're awesome. I'm not going to make it. Evan, come on up here. All right, we've set the bar at $3,500. The NFL's all-time leading rusher, Emmett Smith. His autographed jersey and a picture with Emmett Smith. $500 just to make it fun, act like you care. $1,000 I got, back to you for $1,500. $1,500 I got, back to you. You're not going to buy it. Don't worry about it. $2,000. $2,500 to you. You already went $1,500. What do you stop just to impress your friends? Yeah, get out of here. 2,000, what did I leave off at? 2,000 here, right? 2,000 I got. 2,500, 2,500, 2,500 I got, sir. 3,000, come on, come on, it's for the veterans. $3,000, $3,000, sir. Don't check it out now, he's done. He's at his choke point. Give me 3,500, I'll sell it to you right now. 3,500 once. 3,500. Yeah, right. Anybody in the room for 35? You bought it for $3,000, sir. Come on, Dirk. Thank you, Evan. Hey, you were incredible tonight, my friend. You were incredible. Got it? Oh! oh. Okay. The hell? There we go. Chris, we can buy this. You can use it for a dress. I mean, Dirk Nowitzki's. His auction. $1,000. 1000 I got. Fifteen. Fifteen I got. 2000 sir? 2000 I got. 2500 2500 2500 I got, sir. 3000 to you. You've already got two. Come on, you cheap ass. Come on. You went two. He's at 25. You go to three. 3,000 I got. 3,000, thank you, sir. 3,500, 3,500 I got. We are now looking for the bid to embarrass Roger Staubach. I need $4,000 to embarrass Roger Staubach. 
$4,000. You quitting, sir? 45? 45? He said for 45 I got. 45. I tell you what let's do. You go to $5,000, the house will come down, and we will all just stand and cheer and hope like hell he goes higher. $5,000. We got some work to do when you get up here, Eggman. We got some serious work to do. 5,500. 5,500. You need a fourth. I got 5,000 once. 5,000 twice. You bought yourself a Dirk Nowitzki jersey. Thank you, my man. You're incredible. Thank you. Come on up here, Troy Boy. Thirty-five dollars. Who'll give me thirty-five dollars? Thirty-five dollars. Yeah. All right, here we go. It's our last auction item. It's for the military veterans and heroes on the water. $1,000 just for the hell of it to impress your friends. Thank you. $1,500, $2,000, $2,000, $2,000 I got. $2,500 I got. $3,000, $3,000 I got. $3,000? I got $3,000. $3,500. $4,000 for, it's Troy Eggman. $4,000. 45, sir, 45 I got. Oh, okay. $5,000. 5,500 I got. A new record holder, ladies and gentlemen. 6,000 I need. It's Troy Eggman. He will mention your name on the Fox broadcast. Well, I don't know what the hell. Uh, what the hell do I know? $6,000! $6,000! Don't fail me now. I know you can afford it. Oh, $6,500! $7,000. I was going to buy the damn thing. I got to. One last bid. I need $7,500 so the room will go nuts. $7,500. Five hundred. What? Seventy-five. Eight thousand dollars. Are you buying the son of a bitch? Don't leave me now, sir. We're taking every damn guy that's ever served in the military fishing. We're going to drown every damn worm in the Trinity River. 75, 8, 8,500. 8,500. It's a measly, you already bid 75? It's a measly $1,000. Forget the 75, $8,500. Bye-bye.
Rock is backstage crying his ass off right now. I just... Let's just try it just for the hell of it. $8,500 to $10,000, and I will sell it for $10,000 and walk this man off the stage who came back from Paris. He lost, he lost almost $9,000 in guaranteed hotel rates just to be here tonight. But if you don't want to cough up a little money, I've got 8,500, I want $10,000, I'll let you, $10,000. Come on, come on, come on. That's pretty damn impressive when I say so myself. You are the man, sir. You are the man. Come on down here. Come on, come on. Let her up here, let her up here. Come on. She just told Troy, I don't have $10,000. That's incredible. Get the picture. Another round of applause for all of them. Where's my raffle item? None? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, man. Love the party. Thank you all. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all from my heart. As Roger mentioned when he started, the Navy's important to him. I served, I was a hell of a lousy sailor. But my best friend was killed in Vietnam and he will be 18 years old forever. And what these men and women are doing today, everyone in this room owes them a round of applause. on the water. Heroes on the water. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Be careful out there. Thank you.